Good day to you, wherever in the world you may be watching or listening to this. My name is Gordon Harris from the Gowling WLG International Leadership Team, and this is the latest in our series of interviews with leading figures in the IP world. It's hard to imagine anyone to whom the expression leading figure applies more than my guest today. Over the last 40 years and more, he's been one of the best known and most influential figures in the IP world as a leading barrister in the field, judge, Lord Justice of Appeal, and more recently as Professor of IP Law at one of the world's leading universities, University College London. I'm delighted to welcome the Right Honourable Professor Sir Robin Jacob. Good morning, Robin. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. So what are you up to these days? What's keeping you busy at UCL? Not a lot. Well, I'm, I'm only a part-time professor at UCL, so I've got, I'm, I'm doing some arbitration, mediation, great new trade just in the last five years, years of mock trials for big cases where you uh, expert witness in foreign proceedings, uh, a bit wow. of general international advisory work. That's what I'm doing outside UCL, in UCL. Um, I don't actually take formal series of classes. I go to other people's classes sometimes and join in and ask difficult questions and tell <laughs> war stories and jokes. Perfect. The students, um, I thought the, 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 my, 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 the academics who run the course wouldn't like it, but it turns out they rather enjoy it. Uh, it breaks up because it's a two hour session, or it used to be when, we, when it was all live. Now we're going to do 20 minutes. Uh, said people's extension span isn't it any longer. Now, I don't <laughs> believe it, but that's what they said. Gosh. Um, I, I do, we have our MOOC team for the Oxford IP MOOC. I'm very proud. My very first MOOC team, one is in my old chambers and one is in 11 South Square. Oh, wow. Uh, so, I mean, you, you know, giving a, giving a few kids a, a, a big boost is quite fun. Um, people gave me a boost years ago, and uh, there's something in that. Um, Indeed, yeah. I did, um, I, I did my degree at, uh, at UCL. I just remember, I well remember the very first day there was a, a dean called Jim Stevens who said, you're now going to train to be lawyers, which means in three years time when I say to you, good morning, you will say, what's your criteria for good and please define morning, which was <laughs> quite depressing, but probably true. No, I don't mean Jim, I don't know, I, I, wasn't <laughs> U, I wasn't at my brother at UCL. In fact, my whole family was at UCL, my father at UCL, my brother at UCL. My brother-in-law at UCL, my brother-in-law's wife was at UCL. Um, I didn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you went to Cambridge instead. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how did you get into the world of IP in the first place? Um, well, because I wasn't, nobody else wanted me. <laughs> <laughs> it all goes back actually to a, um, a, an expedition at school in some ways. Uh, I, I had a friend called Roberts, Alan Roberts. His daughter is Alice Roberts, um, and he, he was very keen on flying, and he joined the Air Cadets. And when in our sort of A level years, must have been my last year because I'd already got to Cambridge because that's the point of the story. And he took me to Biggin Hill on the back of his motorbike, and we went up in a two seater Tiger Moth with big old helmets and things. Um, I was all shaken up with that, and I know he had to come back. And in those days, families went to um. Uh, the theatre together. So my parents organised these trips to go and see the old Vic, Shakespeare at the old Vic. And um, I, I came back from Biggin Hill via um, South London uh, and I had to go and see my dad first because he was in the law courts and uh, I was a bit too early. So he, and he said, I've got to go to a party. So he, he said, just go and stand in the corner. It was in one pump court. So I did. And I, and it was a retirement of a party of a very distinguished commercial sort called D.N. Frith. He was obviously a top, top class. They didn't make him a high court judge because he was very left wing. But everybody was there. Denning was there. Helsham was there. All sorts of people. I don't know who the hell they were, but I did. But, but anyway, I got talking to this short fellow in the corner. Uh, he turned out to be a chap called R.G. Lloyd. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to Cambridge. What are you reading? And I said, science. He said, when you finish, he said, come to the pattern bar. I've never heard of that. Um, um, and come and see me. So that gave me a, a thing. But anyway, at Cambridge, the degree wasn't going too good in my second year. And I realized I, I wasn't going to be the Nobel Prize when I had ambitions to be. Um, and so I had a lot of friends who were lawyers. So I rang up my dad and said, I'm, I'm going to be a barrister. But still didn't think the patent bar. I thought I'd be a real barrister. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and 
I, he did that and I went out with Gray's Inn and then uh, the Gray's Inn student advisor said you should do a law degree. So I was very lucky. I, he said, go and do an evening course. And I, I went to my father, I said, ridiculous, I'm doing the bar exam. She said, I'll pay for it. So I went and did the evening course. And I was taught by a young lecturer called Bill Cornish, who knew oh. nothing about patents either <laughs> at that time. And that went really well, that degree. And then I did a pupillage at the same time. I took a year off and taught at Kingston University, uh, Polytechnic in those days. Um, and um, my dad got me a pupillage. He just did it in that, that way in those days. The chap yeah. Nigel Bridge, Treasury Junior. Uh, and I didn't even dare ask him. Well, looking back on it, I, if I had asked, I, they would have taken me. He told me that. But I didn't even ask to go into those chambers. And I, I sort of, nobody would want me. I said, I'll go in the pattern bar because that's a, a completely moribund backwater. I heard it was very boring and very dull. <laughs> Nothing was all wrong. Um, it was the best thing that ever happened. And it was all because R.G. Lloyd suggested I did go to see him. I, he, he wanted to pay me a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> that, I, that was I suspicious. <laughs> I mean, he was still paying for pupillage in those days. Um, and I, I found out late, he was, he got a lot of people to write his speeches and so on and so forth. He was a politician. Right. So, so I didn't go there. I did go to, um, I, first of all, I tried Edmonton's chambers, like Pat Graham's chambers, but they wouldn't have me. And they suggested I went to somebody in, in Francis Taylor building. So I wrote to him and he said he was retiring, go and see Walton. And the place was practically falling apart when I went there. There were just four of them. Well, I remember Francis Taylor buildings very well because I mean, I, I arrived in IP by not quite such a circuitous route, but still by happenstance. I didn't have any particular background in it, but I was working as a junior lawyer with a partner called Rupert Hughes, who uh, had instructed you on the uh, UK case and referral to the ECJ, as it then was in Veng and Volvo, if you remember all that. I don't remember. I don't remember the case frame. I mean, what I remember a bit. I remember coming to Birmingham. I had a meet. We had a meeting in Birmingham. That was quite unusual to go up for a meeting. And I think Isabel Davis was there too. Yes, she was. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. That's the, the, and I remember having a meeting, and we. I never got to the ECJ. No, you didn't. I went with Peter Prescott. Actually, yeah, I know. Yeah, I yeah. always think they they got that wrong. Um, <laughs> there was something very fishy going on with our copyright law at that time. It, it, the copyright protecting spare parts. Yeah. Um, the House of Lords answer, we can't have that, was awful. Um, um, yes. I mean, it was a disgrace. They, 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 they found on the ground that had never been argued, never put to the party, and was completely wrong. <laughs> well, yeah, that can happen even now, can't it? But there, yeah. It can. <laughs> so did, what, what was the first case you, you handled as a judge? Can you remember that? Yeah, I can remember the first case I handled as a judge. I mean, they put me in the... In the uh, as an order 14, that's part 24 to these days, summary judgment application in a case of fraud, alleged fraud, but which had only recently the rules had been changed. You couldn't do summary judgment in the case of fraud, but you could now. And I remember observing the judgment, I probably heard it on Thursday, Friday, coming in the weekend, and writing it and saying, what the bloody hell have I got myself in for here? <laughs> Um, I, I found fraud, and it, it went. And they took it to the Court of Appeal as of right as you could. Um, well, I heard that Andrew Leggett, Lord Justice Leggett, said, at, at last the Chancery judge who recognises a fraudster when he sees one. <laughs> That's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I heard that through the back door, of course. <laughs> In your, you know, early days as an IP judge, you were very much seen by the professions anyway as part of a team with Hugh Laddie. I mean, did it feel like that? Did you work together? Did you talk uh, about uh, the cases? Hugh and I you had a very strange, we were, we were kind of like brothers at the bar. We saw things, we hardly ever had to finish sentences because I knew what he was going to say and he knew what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, but uh, like brothers, we were also quite rivals. Uh, and uh, it was a very, not always easy relationship. But, we, of course, for running the court, we did. Although, in a sense, I, I, I think I ran it differently from him. Um, I was very disappointed when I came back from circuit because he'd been running the court. And it had, got, it had slowed down. He spent all his, he used to worry too much. He wanted to read all the papers. I used to say he would read the patent right down to the little bit at the back of the patent, which they had on those days, with the Queen's printer's name at the very bottom <laughs> of the back of the patent. <laughs> um, he, 
so there, there, was, there was a, a rivalry. We had a, I think a comic story. We both said we're never going on the bench. And we solemnly wrote a document, an agreement, which said if either of us goes on the bench, the other, uh, we will buy the other one a dinner at a restaurant of his choosing. Um, and we put it in Chambers safe. He didn't try and collect at the beginning. I don't know why. Um, no, I think it's still in the Chambers safe. <laughs> <laughs> it must be. Well, I'm going to be um, I'm going to be talking to John Call in a few weeks' time on one of these him. interviews, so I'll ask him. <laughs> <laughs> he, can go, he can go look it out for me. <laughs> there we go, John Call being the, the clerk, of course, in those days. Well, and I stole him. I stole him. I stole him from from uh, what what is now the um, New Square. All right. And six pump court. He was the junior clerk there, and I was really impressed with him. And basically, Chambers was not run terribly well. Blanco was head of Chambers, let everything just run. Sydney was getting on. He'd been the clerk. He'd been in Chambers since 1927. Gosh. And he was aging a bit, and uh, you know, he didn't collect any fees. You know, I had to invent the fee system and it all sorts. You could, it was small output. You could do all those things. And um, we couldn't get a decent junior clerk because Sydney was so kind that anybody interviewed got the job on the grounds they had an interview. <laughs> <laughs> and we had all and a bunch of really useless junior clerks. I said, we've got to get that guy. And apparently when Sydney rang up, um, John, the clerk over there, said, I've been dreading this call. <laughs> Oh yeah, and uh, well, you know, it was obviously a good shout because he's been around a long time, hasn't he? Yeah, seventy-four, I think it was. So what, when you when you look back, what do you think is the most important case you've been involved in? Oh, there's no doubt about it, Norwich Chronicle. Right. Anthony Walton's genius idea. You haven't seen it all through, but it's undoubtedly. Um, it was a it was ahead of a battle, because we. No other Chancery judge but Pat Graham would have found for us. We got the Court of Appeal, they thought it was ridiculous and threw us out. Um, and then we had an application for leave to appeal, which took all day in the Moses Room of the House of Lords. They were very interested in things thing called Section 3 of the Finance Act, and uh, which never surfaced in the main case at all. Um, and we got ourselves organized with a huge amount of work. The first time anybody had ever photocopied authorities was that case. We did it because we were photocopying lots of ancient books and lots of things they didn't have copies of. And the clients said they would do it. The solicitors couldn't do it. Um, and they did it. And then they said, well, why don't we do the lot? We still, I think they've still got the five volumes in, 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 in chambers. Wow. Know, you can ask John that too. <laughs> um, and. Uh, we said we'd argue, we, we thought they were soft on what they call crown privilege, the, the public interest, the, the crown, the government protecting wrongdoers didn't sound a very attractive proposition. We thought we could win that one first and then they want to find us out. We got to, got to, got to the House of Lords and Anthony got up and uh, uh, Lord Reed said, Mr. Bolton, their lordships would like you to deal with the question of this, the action for discovery first. <laughs> Oh, yes, my <laughs> so off we went, and it went on for about a whole first week and a bit of the second week. A um, week? Wow. No, we haven't finished yet. The story went on uh, uh, into the second week, and I think on um, the Wednesday of the second week, we finished, and they said they would, uh, on, on, the, on, on the, in the after, after, in the early morning, that's right, early morning because we walked up and down the corridor and they sat in there in that long corridor in the, in the house of lords we walked up and down lunch came lunch went and at quarter four door bang the then the usher came out council we all came in and, Le and reed said and by this time they'd lost one of them kill brandon had been sick <laughs> and they just carried on with four and reed said mr walton mr oliver their lordships are evenly divided. We want you to come back next week and re-argue it, and Lord Kilbrandon will be back. <laughs> and did you? We won five nil. We never knew which two changed their mind. Wow. So, so when it was two all, you didn't know how that split happened. No. Yeah. 
But you can almost tell that important case when it, it applies its name to something and has stuck with it ever since. So, you know, we still talk about Norwich Pharmacal orders to this day. I mean, you know, it's... Um, I know. Yeah. It's better than calling them whatever they're called now. Well, indeed. It's like the old Anton Pillar, which is now search and seizure and how very prosaic and unromantic that is. But there we are. Uh, when I was a student in London, I used to go and watch Lord Denning in the Court of Appeal. I used to love listening to his voice. But I've always felt there was a little bit of Lord Denning about you. You've got a very strong sense of justice, a willingness to make the law fit around the needs of justice where necessary. Is that, is that fair? I don't actually think it is, really. I think I followed the law much more than Denning did. <laughs> I mean, if, if ever a star fell fast, it was Denning. Yeah. He, I mean... I reckon, uh, you, you told me you were going to ask this question, I, I, I look back, I can only think of, he was cited to me in my entire judicial career, maybe three or four times. Wow. By the time I'd gone, the bench his star had gone. It's interesting, isn't it? He's still, still a bit of him around estoppel, I suppose, but yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, the, the case I had in mind was one of mine, actually, that you may or may not remember. A, a very long-running entitlement case called Simpress and Malaya, and um, which was argued in front of you in the Court of Appeal by Peter Prescott. And um, the, the, we were dragging up 19th century authorities, and I think you knew who was right and who was wrong. You called both the main protagonists liars in your, in your judgment, actually, and they were. Um, but I, I was always very grateful to you because I felt that, that we did bend things a little bit to get the right outcome. Do you have any recollection of that? Uh, I remember the name, uh, but I can't remember what it was about at all. Was, was that the one where there'd been a, a previous finding? Um, that's it. That's I mean, it. Yeah. yeah, well, that was that, that was a very plain case. It wasn't when we were doing justice. I don't think I was bending anything. The guy had gone off and um, and had a, had one of those moments when he decided he didn't want to go to his deathbed having lied. Yeah, so that's, right, that's right. He, he confessed. Well, that was new evidence. It was, it was admissible. What was the matter with that? <laughs> what, you don't often get you don't often don't get a witness later on who would get believed by the judge coming along and saying, well, as a matter of fact, I was lying then. I know, I know. That was, <laughs> yeah. So um, we talked about you know the most important case was Norwich Pharmacal. What are you most proud of? Well, it's actually a sort of follow-on of, of all the things that I the thing I the biggest accolade I ever got. Well, it came out this way. Um, I got Tom Bingham to lead me in a case called Columbia Trademark in the European Court of Justice, the first big reference, the second reference from this country. And it was the references from Germany and uh, Denmark too. And he came over a bit late and we were in the bar of the hotel, which I think was a Holiday Inn at that point, opposite the court. And he was pretty upset because he just lost in the Court of Appeal with Denning in his favor and the other two, Starman and somebody else against him in a case called D and the NSPCC. And uh, it, the NSPCC for whom Tom appeared had been ordered to disclose the name of an informer who had said that somebody was beating her, the, the plaintiff was beating up her kid. She brought a negligence action and she was brought to be on discovery. And curious enough, the master had ordered this, the name, the disclosure was my father. Uh, <laughs> The judge had said no, and, and the Court of Appeal 2 1 and said yes. Um, and I said, Well, I'm sure we had some stuff about the, all this in, in, in the research we did for Norwich. There's some public interest in, in things. We, had. we saw everything that possibly there could be in Norwich. So I thought, no, well, we just discussed it, and then we went on and did Columbia. And then a week or so later, I got a telephone call. Tom, would I be his junior in the House of Lords? Oh. <laughs> that was the one. We won five nil there. <laughs> oh. That's it. That's that, that's it. That's fascinating how that comes about, isn't it? Yeah. Do, do, do you um? And you may not want to answer this question. It's up to you, really. Do you? Can you think of a judgment which, with hindsight, you might have got wrong? You wish you. Could I know have one. Been. I know one. I did get wrong, and that was Connor and Angie attack, and I, I plainly got that wrong, and, and Hoffman was right. He's reversed me a number of times. Um, I think I was also completely wrong in, in that, own, uh, in, in that um, case about inventorship. Uh, part, just partly because the point, what, the simple point which they knocked me down over were, were, was never put to me. It was all done, dressed up in some other way. 
Right. Um, but, 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 and I think I'd have bought it then. But um, I, I can't think of any others I've got definitely wrong. I remember, I remember Connor and Andrew Tech because at the time it felt like a real high watermark in obviousness, and then the House of Lords sort of rode it back a bit. But um, quite a bit. I mean, I was just ridiculous. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I'm now, you know, I'm thinking about. I'm writing an article about plausibility at the moment, and I think they got all that wrong. It's. I don't see why the invention has got to be implausible. Why should? Why is it got to be implausible? I mean, more implausible is the bigger the invention may be if it works. I'm going to look forward to reading that because I must admit the whole concept's developed a, a life of its own, isn't it? It's yeah. sort of boring off. And it's not exactly new news. I mean, it's turned up in judgments all down the years, but it's suddenly become, you know, yeah. the buzzword. But yeah. so obviously you're still, you know, taking that kind of level of active, um, active interest in <clears throat> what's going on in the law. But now, now you're retired as a judge. When you look at the cases now, are there any current issues where you <clears throat> would love to go back and have your say? I mean, I don't know how fascinating you find the whole set friend stuff. Well, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't feel like I want to say on, on set friend, frankly. Um, uh, <laughs> it's got to the position which I, I, I put out in a paper in 2014 for my, well, I run these international conferences, so I've been running every two years, uh, one on patents in telecoms, or patents now in telecoms and the Internet of Things. It was due to happen, of course, this year, but it's not going to. I, I did manage to do it last year um, in uh, um, Tokyo. Anyway, I put out a paper for that in, in 2014. We were doing the George Washington. I want to move it around the world. Uh, George Washington in, in, in DC. Um, and it's exactly what I said. It's a contract law. A uh, third party can enforce a contract, you know, the French law. Um, the, the, the rate setting is seems to be perfectly sensible. Um, uh, the, big, the big problem for that, that, that branch of law now is competitive jurisdictions. Well, quite. Anti-suit yeah. anti -suit and anti-anti-suit and maybe anti-suit cubed <laughs> <laughs> injunctions. <laughs> yes, but of course the, the sort of resurgent Chinese jurisdictions are getting, having their say as well and that complicates matters mightily. Yeah, it's, I mean also China itself is, it, 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 it can't make up, obviously they don't want to pay anything in the first place. Uh, and that's so simple now. Um, Huawei is yeah, one yeah. of the really big holders of SEPs for 5G, maybe the biggest. Yes, well, quite. Right. Yeah. I, I always wonder whether they whether, whether they think they won or lost the Supreme Court case. Well, that's I mean that's one of a number of recent Supreme Court judgments that have been a bit ambiguous. And I was going to ask you about that because in, in, in your day, you know, there was Lord Hoffman in what was then the House of Lords. You had Willie Aldous in the Court of Appeal, you, Hugh Laddie, Nicholas Pumphrey in the High Court. It was a pretty formidable team. Now we've got Lord Kitchen, we've got um, Colin going to the Court of Appeal, we've got Richard Mead appointed. Um, <clears throat> do you feel that, that we're, we're getting another contingent of strong IP judges yeah. at the moment? Yeah, we are. They're probably stronger. They're, I mean, overall, uh, <coughs> uh, maybe at every level, a bit stronger than it was then. Um, I think we, 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 we're, we're very well placed, and I, I, we may not have seen the end of it. No, <coughs> well, there is a there is a strong rumor. I'm not going to ask you to speculate about that, but there are various rumors. Oh, no, no, I, think I don't know. No, well, neither neither <laughs> do I'm very well, it's, speculate too. <laughs> it's unbelievable, unbelievably cloak and dagger these days. About you know, it can, well, it's ridiculous. I mean, I mean, the, 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 the appointment system is completely barking mad. It's not uh, transparent. I'll say, give it that. You know, it's a, it's also incredibly ponderous. Yeah. Yes, but well, uh, they seem to have been so many, so many sort of hurdles to jump these days before you can get anywhere. I mean, it's um... you have to apply. I mean, I didn't have to apply. I I got sent for. I got a letter from the Lord Chancellor's permanent secretary. Dear Robin, as you know, from time to time, I like to discuss matters with senior members of the bar. Perhaps you'd be kind enough to uh, get your clerk to make an appointment with my secretary for tea. <laughs> and you know what I that. I had no idea that's what he had in mind, actually. Really? No, I was I'm a bit innocent. <laughs> Are you glad? Are you glad you did? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic job. I mean, the bar is bloody hard. Yeah. Uh, uh, a pattern bar is particularly hard, partly because um, you're expected to do trials. And that means cross-examining professors, Nobel Prize winners on their own subject. 
quite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's um, and uh, when I see the level of preparation that goes in the last few weeks and during a trial, it is awesome. I'm amazed that people aren't, you know, God knows what what um, sort of performance enhancing drugs get taken at that I'll time. I'll tell you what we did. <laughs> My last case was Chiron. Right. And, um, and we had a very good team at Bristow's. Everybody in that team did well after the sec one of the secretaries became a solicitor. The, the younger chap, well, I think one of the, the, the fellow was a, a paralegal. He, he's got, uh, he's, he's, I think he's either a solicitor, he's got a quite successful business. I mean, he's not in IP. Um, every, everybody did fine, um, except one person. Um, anyway. <clears throat> I, I got this team together. My junior was David Kitchen, and my second junior was Richard Mead. And I said, We're going to have to work on weekends. Partly because the solicitors have meetings with the clients, and you have to actually get on with it sometimes and just keep them all out. Um, and so Richard came in with a small volume, uh, paperback, The World's Filthiest Jokes. He, he said, <coughs> We'll have a reading from this every hour. <laughs> uh, now, that's how you keep yourself sane. There's a follow-up story too, because Peter Prescott was one of the sorts on the other side. And when we finished this, um, Richard got hold of one of the standard Bristow's looking volumes, um, marked it up as volume 50. He took this thing, took all the papers out, because it was a redundant volume, um, and put it through a, a homemaker, and stuck this thing inside, went up to the clock and said, next time some papers come down for Mr. Prescott, would you put this in? <laughs> we learned that Peter wasn't always reading his papers. He never found out, as far as we know. But in the <laughs> middle of the trial, Simon Thorley was in desperate straits, wanted to put up a volume about worms. What the hell they had to do with the virus, I do not know. Uh, never did find out. But anyway, he, he put it up and he said, my Lord, may we call this volume 50? <laughs> Three of us broke into laughter and nobody else knew why we were laughing. <laughs> uh, Pete, uh, I did a um, very well, a couple of big cases with Peter and, and the, the thing was the fact that he would arrive for a 10.30 start at 10.29 and 57 seconds. You'd just be just thinking he's not going to make it and then the door would open and he'd sweep in. But uh, yeah. it was all, all good fun. So let's end this section of, of, of our discussion on a, on a high note. Then, you know, you told a few funny stories down the road, but what, what's the funniest thing that happened to you in court? Well, I don't know. I, I think that, that, that volume 51 was actually one. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there was a moment when I can't remember what the joke was. It doesn't really matter. But whatever it was, Jeffrey Hobbs made the joke. I was, on, I was the judge and I couldn't start laughing. It was a case about dirty books. <laughs> Michael Feist was on the other side. <coughs> I don't cool. know what, what yeah. Jeffrey said. <laughs> but, and I fed in a fit of giggles. And I finally managed to stop. And I said, Mr. Hobbs, I'm supposed to make the ju jokes and you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> It's where, yeah, when a fit of giggles descends, it can be infectious, got it, run around the whole court. Well, thank you very much indeed, Robin. I'm d delighted to say we're not stopping there. Um, Robin has kindly agreed to make this a double header, so we'll be back for a second session, moving on to a few more contemporary topics, maybe, but not least the, the fate or plight of the Unified Patents Court. And I'll look forward to that very much. But in the meantime, thank you very much again to Robin and to all of you for listening in. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.